Last Sunday, uh, May the 22nd, marked the 24th anniversary of the simultaneous referenda in both sides of the, on both sides of the border on the Good Friday Agreement. The agreement was endorsed by 94% of people here and 71% of people in Northern Ireland. It was endorsed by 85% of those voting across the island as a whole. It was a transformative moment for the island. I remember that day vividly, uh, as I expect most do in this House. Maybe for a younger generation who don't remember it firsthand, the, important and, um, and the importance and emotion of, the, of that vote was captured in dramatic form in the final episode of Derry Girls last week, for anybody who watches it. Those referenda gave democratic legitimacy to the Good Friday Agreement. The agreement itself gave us the frameworks to end violence, to build cross-community representative government, and to manage the relationship in Northern Ireland between North and South and between these islands on the basis of partnership, equality and mutual respect. Right now, the Good Friday Agreement is under strain, along with the spirit of partnership that underpins it. It's under strain from unilateral action, already taken and threatened. It's under strain from those who refuse to operate its institutions. It's under strain from those who wrap their actions in the language of defending the agreement, but whose actions do not match those words. And that's why we're here this evening. And I want to thank this House for facilitating this debate. At present, the British-Irish relationship seems to be lurching from announcement to announcement, standoff to standoff. With so much going on, there is a risk that we normalise crises. It's worth stopping to reflect on the operation of the agreement and its wider context. Since the 5th of May, since the 5th of May's elections, the DUP has refused to allow the formation of an executive or even to facilitate the election of a speaker to get the assembly up and running. This is a time when Northern Ireland has so many bread and butter political challenges to face. Participation in the North-South Ministerial Council is one of the essential responsibilities attached to ministerial office in the Northern Ireland Executive. The DUP has boycotted the NSMC since autumn of last year. Along with others, the DUP do have real concerns in relation to the operation and impact of the Northern Ireland Protocol. I read, readily acknowledge that and I'll return to it later. But those concerns are no reason not to stand up the operation of the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement that we all say we are committed to. Elsewhere, we've heard how the balance of the agreement must be protected, that East-West must match North-South. One of the key East-West institutions of the agreement is the British-Irish Council. The agreement provides that the British-Irish Council will meet at summit level twice a year. The Council does meet but the current British Prime Minister has yet to attend. Then there are those for whom the protocol is a stalking horse. They can move seamlessly from criticism of the protocol to calling uh, for the agreement itself to go. By and large, they are those with no political mandate, who never supported the agreement in the first place, and who seek to damage it from the outside. Treating the agreement lightly only plays into those hands. The Good Friday Agreement is not a flag of convenience. It is a solemn responsibility endorsed by our people, and it is a shared responsibility. From the outset, it was always clear that Brexit would profoundly impact Northern Ireland and relationships on this island. At an early stage, both the EU and the UK agreed that a unique solution was required for Ireland as a whole. Reaching that solution required a long, detailed and difficult negotiation, with a shared focus on minimising disruption and a, great, uh, and a great spirit of compromise. And we achieved a jointly uh, an agreement between the EU and the UK. Uh, uh, that solution became known as the Protocol. But given the misinformation about the Protocol in recent weeks, it's important that we recall clearly and truthfully what the protocol actually achieves and what it was designed to do. This solution, arrived at jointly, protects the Good Friday Agreement and the gains of the peace process. 
It fully and expressly recognises Northern Ireland's constitutional status and the principle of consent, protected in the Good Friday Agreement. It avoids a hard border on the island of Ireland, protects the common travel area and north-south cooperation, and provide, provides for no diminution of rights, safeguards or equality of opportunity for the people of Northern Ireland. Very importantly, for thousands of businesses, it gives Northern Ireland unique access to both the UK and EU internal markets. Despite all of this, and the fact that they negotiated it, the British government now claim that, that implement, implementing the protocol that we agreed together is incompatible with the Good Friday Agreement. This is disingenuous and it's dangerous. I find it deeply disappointing that the British government has said that it intends to table legislation in the coming weeks that would unilaterally disapply elements of the protocol, which is now international law. This action is contrary to the spirit of the Good Friday Agreement, where genuine trust and partnership between both governments have, time and time again, proved crucial to shared progress. As the protocol is an integral part of an international agreement, such action would amount to a serious violation of international law also. I've urged the British Government to reconsider, to weigh the risks that would flow from unilateral action and to step back from this course of action, as they have done previously.